What does it take for us to build workplaces and a world that is fit for the future? A question that plagues many a leader and many an organization. How do we learn from our experiences? Are we shaping ourselves and our workplaces to be fit for the future? What does it take to invest in people and nurture success? How do we ensure that our investments in diversity, equity and inclusion are delivering to the intended goals? Are we seeing the very invisible responsibility that most employees carry, that of being caregivers? What does it take to build a caregiver-friendly workplace? Are leaders caregivers? What can leaders and organizations learn from caregivers and their experiences? How do we create safe spaces that enable inclusion? Is this something that is holding especially women back from the C-suite. We are delighted to bring to you a series of conversations around the idea of building future fit corporate. Deepa is an optimist, a learner, and a sharer. What a delightful introduction. Lumiere is a research and consulting solutions company that she founded in 1996. It's a unique business model where the core team researchers, core team researchers and analysts are all women. Hmm. What does that say for our conversation today? So uh, earnest, hardworking, sincere, dependable is what her clients say they are. Uh, I am sure there's something to be said about the workplace culture. Uh, 2013 was a milestone year for Deepa with uh, Rashmi Bansal featuring her in a book on women entrepreneurs titled Follow Every Rainbow. That is something that we share, uh, Rashmi Bansal. Deepa, uh, so delighted to have this conversation with you. Thank you, Bhavna. In fact, uh, caregiving, I believe, uh, is, a, is a perpetual experience. Because I feel mm -hmm. uh, at any point in time, you know, one doesn't have to be young or old. I saw mm -hmm. intimately caregiving exercised by my grandparents because both my parents worked and I stayed with my grandparents till I was four. And mm -hmm. I again experienced caregiving because uh, there was a, a family decision by my parents and my grandparents to actually live together when I was about 11 years old mm -hmm. because my father my father had a lot of heavy load bearing because of my mother's uh, illness and, uh, you know, her repetitive uh, challenges around her health uh, to do with a bronchitis condition and frequent hospitalizations and two little girls and my grandfather on the other hand my maternal grandfather uh, had suffered a heart attack and you know needed care so it was a, a a conversation that they had that maybe they should live together and for me caregiving uh, seeing it as a planful activity having a conversation which also meant adjustments on the part of this couple with two little kids and an older couple uh, in a societal framework where parents don't stay in the girl's house but they do in the boy's house and so on and so forth was a very interesting um, observation and I also saw a lot of sharing of the load that my father did even in mm. those times, as did my grandfather. So somewhere, uh, the the gender lens for me was very broad, and it meant mm -hmm. uh, equal load sharing. But today we know mm. that, uh, you know, this is not a case. So this is not, mm. this was a very much of an outlier family that you're talking about, where my father would expressly tell my mother and my nani, okay, now y'all have you've done the cooking X, X Y Z. I'm going to do the dishes, and I'm talking of the mid seventies. And wow. Bhavna, I can see you smiling. Yeah, please carry on uh, because this is an important thing to talk about. Yes, and when we talk of caregiving, somewhere it is very important to bring this conversation on who's bearing the load. And how do right. might we all share the load? Uh, so it yeah. was not just about the elders caring uh, for the children or the elders caring for other elders. Well, very early on, we 
saw the mantle of caregiving fall upon our shoulders when my grandfather was detected, ident detected with Parkinson's. My grandmother had cancer. And you know, there was a, a very, I think at a very early age, one took charge, which meant if my father was on tour and I was the primary caregiver in the hospital and I was still in class eight or class nine, I had a lot of you know awareness of the files, the questions to ask the doctors to make sure what were the contraindications of the medication. So health care to someone who uh, has a chronic illness, somebody who has an age, an elderly uh, uh, illness or something like a CA, which can happen to anybody at any age. So you know, one saw a full spectrum as also what it meant to have a younger sibling and therefore taking you know care and responsibility for that sibling. Uh, mm. uh, 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 you know, responsibly when if my mother was in hospital or unwell and so on and so forth. So, so care and caring almost became a part of my personality and my humanity. And it sort of defined me. And later on, when Belinda and I opted to have, uh, you know, when we plan to have kids or we have dogs, you know, the whole, you, you extend the continuum of caregiving uh, when you also take responsibility for an animal that doesn't speak. So I, I, you've said it so beautifully and I relate with it. Um, a lot of times, you know, when we speak about uh, caregiver support or we say caregiver sati is doing this, that or the other, oftentimes I'm told, oh, my God, that's so niche or niche, depending on what your way of pronouncing the word is. Uh, and it always leaves me wondering, why would you call it uh, so specialized and so niche? Because it is omnipresent and it is there in everybody's life and it is there pretty much for a very significant part of your life, uh, not just adulthood. Uh, so um, perhaps there are different experiences and... Uh, you know, how we respond to it. And I particularly like what you said about how it contributes to not just who we are, but our humanity and, you know, what we contribute in our lives. Yes. Deepa, uh, what I would like for you to probably comment on, uh, because this is a great segue, there are uh, there is that element of experiencing something that is beyond gender, but in your you know, you chose to build an organization that has predominantly women. My guess is that they came with a variety of experiences, quite possible, uh, you know, uh, came from experiences different from yours. And um, having worked in organizations or known of others who have worked in organizations, what is the experience of caregivers in workplaces and uh, specifically women. Yeah. So, you know, there are uh, organizations that I have been uh, very, very lucky to get an opportunity to work with. Like I joined Hindustan Lever from campus. And Hindustan Lever, mm -hmm. as you know, has always been ahead of the curve where it yeah. comes to uh, enabling women in the workplace. And I'm talking then of 87, so I was batch, I, mm. I, I joined them in 1987. And when my uh, son was born in 1992, uh, that year, November, uh, Niall Fitzgerald, the Unilever chairman, they made an announcement of a two year career break for women professionals. Uh, that mm. was well ahead of its time. And I was probably one of the first women to avail of that uh, uh, bhavna. And in I took a career break at that time when, uh, you know, it was not planned. I went back to work and that's when I uh, I realized that I wasn't feeling, uh, you know, uh, I was feeling something amiss. I was, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have a good feeling about it. And that's when I uh, first thought about it or even gave myself permission to think of a career break because I come from a family where all the women work. So even I hadn't even uh, conceptualized that I might want to take time off and it was only when I took time off was when I and I went away overseas uh, soon enough I realized that I was quite efficient with the way I you know did things and I was still missing the whole uh, part of uh, you know the uh, the work 
also, you know. So and that's when I realized that something blended, something that would allow a person to do both well, because I wanted to play all my roles well. And I was figuring that this not working was making me crabby, unhappy. I wasn't really being a good wife or a good mother. You know, I was I was very low. I was very, very low. And that's when I got the insight for Lumiere and you asked about why women the idea was there must be women like me who want to do both who want a professional uh, working opportunity work opportunity with the flexibility and home mm. computing had just started Bhavna we were in Jamaica at that time when I took a career break I wanted to live in Jamaica so we took Rahul and Milan and I went there he was in consulting uh, Milan was in consulting and in in the three years that I, I was there, I also got an opportunity to uh, do a host of things, including work with a research firm. I, I taught at the university. I taught market research at the uh, University of West Indies as a, a visiting faculty. And I was a parent. And I was doing multiple things. And the idea that when we go back to India, this is what I want to do. Because you know, mm -hmm. I wrote to the company and I quit because with the career break you can't work so i i resigned with unilever but i knew ex perfectly well what i wanted to do coming back to india which is start a company that would be uh, something that will provide an opportunity uh, for women professionals to work and uh, the idea because i had worked uh, in sales and marketing and market research i knew that this was possibly an area that uh, I could explore. And Unilever was, you know, coming back. And why I mentioned particularly the company, because even today Unilever, in the, you know, because they are a client and we work very closely, yeah. I've been ahead of the curve with women work and well-being and not just women, but very early on in bringing a gender neutral approach to caregiving. Uh, mm. uh, something that I, I really, really, uh, admire uh, whether it's uh, the crash uh, you know in the services as well as other support that you know opportunities paternity leave you can work from home so you know the recognition that you might you would need uh, care and the organization mm -hmm. going that extra mile to support the employee so I think mm -hmm. that's pretty of course there are IT companies that do it well there is IBM Infosys I'm sure there are TCS, multiple companies that are recognizing the need for uh, employee, uh, employer support uh, for caregiving, mm. be it, mm. uh, uh, you know, be it uh, maternity or paternity or be it. Um, so, so in the examples that, yes, people who reached out to me were primarily women. We did work, you know, so uh, it's not as if we didn't want to work with men. We actually had an experiment. We did have a gentleman come and we said, you know, let's do it as a pilot because I told him, you have all of your leave. Don't quit yet because we had a good job. I said, work. Because, you know, if I'm working with, uh, so my, it, typically in Mumbai, for example, it's a, let's say it's a one bedroom home and the lap computer is in the, that time we still had desktops. Uh, this was a case, a, client, a team member had her home and it was, she was in Villapale, the in-laws were, you know, used to stay, it was a joint family and she would work from home. So if her, the colleague had to travel from Bandra and go to her place, if they were working on a report together, it just wouldn't sit comfortably, you know, for the man. To, and I'm talking now of uh, mid 90s, uh, late 90s. Mm -hmm. So even today, it would be a little uncomfortable. Uh, then, of course, work from home, ka co there was no concept like that, first yeah. of all. Yeah. So it, it also yeah. meant educating. So I still remember yeah. she said, you know, my dad would like to have a conversation with you. So I've even had conversations with the families on what working from home entails. And we had a whole, um, you know, a whole kind of a orientation on how to mm -hmm. work at home. Like we've done in COVID saying, how do you train employees yeah. to work from home? used to do that, including things like we had a whole contingent of 4G women that worked with us. Women, right. you know, women were in the army and they didn't want to teach. You know, they probably want they mm. worked in organizations or they worked in the Navy. They, uh, the husbands, and they wanted to have something which probably was closer to business and that kind of work. And uh, uh, Bhavna, even there, we would say, you know, like if you have a, if the husband's used to you, you coming, you know, coming home from work, and you've made chai for him at five o'clock. Don't hesitate. You keep to the same practice, and then you might 
like to just carry that work a little later after the kids have gone to bed maybe you just want to spend a little time and finish it so you know even flexibility in the day parts bhavna uh, uh, was what we uh, always encouraged and uh, mm-hmm. we said you know there's a math paper don't tell your kid you know i'll teach you at 6 o'clock you're at home you're working from home the child has a difficulty sit with the child you know make them comfortable because you are going to have that at the back of your mind that i still have that mm-hmm. math problem to work on so yeah. i think it's flexibility both ways so it calls for very mature people working in an organization like this like you know you are almost like co-owners or uh, entrepreneurs so it's a very yeah. entrepreneurial model that we created uh, bhavna which mm-hmm. had at the heart of it a uh, special needs of some kind or the other so we had a couple of moms whose children were special needs kids mm. you know so so what you do is also create some kind of a community you create you know other support systems for them with other moms who've gone through these or you know some support groups so and through one mom word of mouth we would have more uh, reaching mm. out because they saw that there is a huge value in this today of course things are very different post covid we live in a different world but our idea was how can you stay a boutique firm uh, we are self funded we deliberately mm-hmm. did not want uh, to take in funding because then that would put a different kind of a pressure in terms of the mm-hmm. intake in term and and we work purely on potential if if mm-hmm. you've not had an op- if you had a career break of a, a certain time but you know all of the other things are there most importantly you align with our values you don't need looking over the shoulder you can take responsibility and you value your flexibility you are able to impute a a, a, a value uh, to what that means because obviously we cannot pay you what the market would pay so there are those trade offs because there is the flexibility that is built in and we do not know uh the uh, you know we would like to have that so there is a fixed and a variable so we kind of worked out a whole economics around it around contribution to project and uh, uh sharing of profits so that's fantastic uh because i do think that um you know uh, examples of business enterprises or opportunities that are you know uh, ahead of their time but uh, you know there are, there are takers for it and uh, you probably build an organization and a successful one at that uh, to be able to offer something that was not uh, yet common place um, and i'm sure many organizations learned from you during the pandemic they um, did i think even before because uh, we had a situation where uh, people actually have or corporates have come and studied us as a hmm. a small organization which is a great place to work which does very good teamwork so from a extraordinary teamwork point of view because the way our mm-hmm. project teams were organized the way people were worked together the culture we embedded into it because you need for a virtual workplace a very strong culture that will be the sticky glue that yeah. holds Yeah. which are discrete in discrete locations together today tech companies are realizing the importance of that and you know for some years of course you've had uh, uh, you've sent people uh, overseas and you've needed to make them feel connected and so on and so forth and it is very important and somewhere it's like the organization cares for the employee an organization in turn extends that to say the employee again as a caregiver is going to be needed to care for be cared for and so forth so you create a virtuous circle of care mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i love how you said that uh, a virtuous uh, uh, cycle of care uh, is at the heart of building organization cultures that can be actually high performing or that can be very uh, modern day uh, relevant um and i'm so glad that organizations uh, reached out to you to understand uh, even before the pandemic and uh, i do find many a times that there are uh, you know leaders across functions uh, even hr who would struggle with the idea of but you know it is so hard to build culture in a remote work setting uh, how do you do that after all you want to have the you know corridor conversations and you want to have the water cooler conversations so um 
if you were to talk about the challenges of work from home cultures and uh, the challenge of building this cohesive high performance culture what would you advise and what would you recommend yeah uh, i think that's a great question uh, so obviously you know when you're an entrepreneur uh, a lot of the organization's bad habits are the entrepreneur's bad habits so you know for example if i uh, have a certain pace at which i need to do things i, I might you know i i would probably start doing something and then you know do a little bit of planning so all of those things were like probably when the organization was about you know 10 15 years old and we were a, a very big team then 45 people so what happened bhavna is uh, you know in in running a workplace like this particularly when you have competitors competitors you see uh, consumer research also becoming commoditized you know so you keep wanting to have differentiation there is a i must introduce at this stage something very interesting in lumia's life happened which is in uh, you know how there is an adversity and there is something which comes mm-hmm. out of it in 2006 my father suffered a stroke and mm-hmm. as the elder of the two girls my my sister was in the ninth month of her pregnancy of a very precious and difficult pregnancy when my father mm-hmm. had the stroke on the 3rd of june my niece mm-hmm. was born on the 22nd of june so you can imagine it was that last 3 months a 3 weeks so to say where my dad was in icu in bombay hospital my sister was in the hospital breach candy and you know mm-hmm. we were sort of really stretched between and and mm-hmm. my uh, 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 children were quite young at that time uh, mm-hmm. post the five weeks of my father's stay in the hospital when we brought him to our place and we had set up you know a uh, uh, a room for him and for attendants and so on so and right next to that was my lumiere office so my you know the guest room became my dad's room so literally i was between doing the caring and the running of lumiere simultaneously while run, looking mm-hmm. after two kids and two dogs all in one house my husband traveled a lot he looked after a north american relations for a a IT uh, company and then that's when he had a conversation with me and he said you know i'm thinking increasingly and lumiere was 11 years or uh, 10 years old at that time and he says mm. you know i'm really thinking is there something i can do to help and mm. he reached out he quit he came down and for that one year he became my dad's primary caregiver and mm. uh, that's when he was also observing how we did things at lumiere and you know he started helping with uh, uh, stuff with uh, you know the finance and the accounts and the travel and that first year itself he saved a ton of money for us just on travel and that's also with milind coming uh, bhavna we set up the consulting practice uh, both of us are trained to be leadership coaches uh, so you know so we were also diversifying uh, mm-hmm. then you know so organically the organization challenges of a large firm with disaggregate after a certain threshold number particularly with this flexibility you there, there are lots of hollow places and you do mm-hmm. not cannot track today of course we uh, have better systems but tracking uh, and creating a practice of accountability takes some time and and you yeah. know you uh, as a a culture which also tends to be soft and caring how do you then mm. balance the accountability responsibility piece and uh, how do you also not take get taken advantage of and you know so it's yeah. it's a it's a tight rope act and we've learned yeah. along the way i think one big thing that has helped us is in 2016 we became a strengths company so we all of the people that work with us including our interns uh, people who come on shorter stints they all go through the gallup strengths uh, assessment and then we do the six weeks of coaching with them and the the team speaks the strengths language so everybody speaks the mm-hmm. same language you have moved issue from you know moved challenge and problem you know from from person to issue based and you have a lot lot more stickiness i think in the organization and uh, Uh, today we again have a a slightly different model of working bhavna today as you know the gig economy has become very uh, and and we realize that in the hard way when some of our very uh, uh, you know 
uh, core team members went on uh, to work as independents with our clients. And obviously, you know, some of the business went there. But that didn't. Uh, so what it meant was that we would have a core team and that core mm. team would be a tight 20 some, you know, like maybe 20 people and then have a, a kind of a galaxy of associates that we work with, preferably people who have been part of Lumiere. So our alumni also uh, became a part of this framework and we have a robust, uh, uh, you know, connect with our alumni, uh, our mm. associates. Well. And then we worked with domain experts who were, uh, and we also have a, a, a strong connect with educational institutions and the faculty to make sure that sometimes you want to triangulate an approach and you want to sort of bring in a certain heft that comes from academia. So we started to work out a very, very interesting network. So Lumiere as a platform. And then we also mm -hmm. had who wanted to probably engage with us with certain domain expertise. So, you know, so we, the core uh, research team also today has expanded and we have, you know, uh, like one or two male designers that work with us or people with special skills. And today it is, we have physical workplace. We have two physical workplaces. And for people in Mumbai, uh, the core team is uh, just between Mumbai and Pune. And people outside mm -hmm. are uh, associates with whom we would engage on project basis and with very specific uh, processes uh, we have uh, uh, you know something called the lomia learning monday we've always had a learning monday so monday morning starts with us unlike other teams they te the people tell me that you know people talk about what are we going to do for the week and or discuss the last week and numbers lumia morning has always been learning and mm. that's a practice i think we've followed for right from the beginning so mm. 20 years and we've not we don't get tempted if there are project deliverables because it is already calendarized and built in it's a non-negotiable and that i think those are certain things which are culture building bhavna because people right. know that it is about continuous learning we are in a part of a knowledge economy we have to be at the cutting edge and we have to be in touch with what's happening and we right. work across you know 18 sectors so you have to have that and today of course with uh, uh, ai being the way it is you, you know we know that unless you bring something an x factor in terms of value mm -hmm. to your clients why would they give me their next custom uh, project yeah. isn't it so we have to be yeah. very practical about it but i think we've always put people before profits and that remains mm -hmm. because like i told you the purpose of the company still remains we have an observership mm -hmm. program bhavna so the observership mm -hmm. program is again another program where women who are at the crossroads of saying you know i have been with the bank for 20 years i'm a chartered accountant but mm -hmm. now my mm -hmm. child is older and i'm you know i really want to find something that i love to do rather than so i want to break the monotony uh, so th mm -hmm. that could be one or now i'm at the stage where my kid has gone off to university and now i really want to think at what it is that i want to do and the uh this observership program is like a fellowship people come and work with us for two months or three months, depending upon what it is. And we, at that point in time, almost do a whole ho hand holding for them to onboard, either back into to the workforce or to help them pivot and to find the direction for them for the next mm -hmm. trajectory of their life and growth. Uh, that, mm -hmm. again, is part of the whole, uh, I think, uh, the mindset is again of caregiving because mm -hmm. if you put a sapling uh, you know directly into let's say you transplant it as opposed to if you hold it in a place like a nursery where you allow mm -hmm. it you know day to day moment to moment care and tracking the mm -hmm. likelihood that it will grow to be a robust tree is better and the intent behind the observership program is that how do we improve the likelihood of stickiness in these women who go back to the workforce and how do we enable them to be resilient in a workplace mm -hmm. or how do we mm -hmm. allow them an expression of their ambition around um, 
it could be a startup idea it could be a family business that she now can think of joining or it mm. could be uh, a non profit that you know an area or sector that she didn't know much about but now through this she's got an idea and she has clarity mm -hmm. so uh, bhavna it works in a it's been working now for 4 years in a very robust way for us mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we have multiple things that have come out of it we used to mm -hmm. do it uh without as much structure but today i think mm -hmm. it's more structured and it's always evolving i think you know there is yeah. nothing like cast in stone every new person that comes to us they have a bandaid saying you know kuch hila ke rakho you know like <laughs> each has something we don't know we are also hungry yeah. for that including an intern yeah. like we always say it's a mm -hmm. you know all learners yeah so let's yeah. approach it like that so it's very yeah. flat it's not a hierarchical workplace very concentric kind of uh, 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 you know an org structure uh, just concentric yeah. circles or so you know people coming together and you might have a an external who connects for a project and we mm. of course have to have a very strong tech uh, background so we went on the crowd cloud bhavna at around in 2007 and we wow. leveraged that to our advantage we had written about as a harvard case the early adopter mm. of of the cloud as a small business so nice and the idea is that if i am working with teams that are sitting in different places my client gets confidence in knowing that they can transparently see what is happening on their project real time right. they have access yeah. to all the materials so the value of transparency has become a very core one for us in right. in helping build trust keeping the trust and somewhere for the teams also to know that you know i must bring my best self to this piece because yeah. my client is watching you know so it also yeah. brings that little little stepping up on responsibility mm. which is mm. very good because you know it's then becomes a self governing system which is sustainable yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely well, what a delightful thing to listen to you and there were so many many things that i'd like to double click on um you know to start with uh, the first one being that you spoke about uh you know a leadership model or an accountability framework uh and i was just wondering uh do you see a connection between competencies or you know unique perspectives that someone who has had a caregiving experience you spoke about it in your introduction as well though bring in for an innovative or uh you know uh, an organization culture that is resilient because you know linking it to building future fit corporates recognizing the uniqueness of the con you know the competencies from a certain experience could be an interesting one what is your I take on that so uh one first of all i think the gallup philosophy celebrates the uniqueness of every individual we right. are like a fingerprint each one of us yeah. has our own unique way of thinking feeling and behaving and we are mm. shaped with our life experiences past and present and if we are open and learning full we are like a kaleidoscope so you throw in one glass piece of a challenge and then something mm -hmm. new and a new beautiful pattern can emerge is the way i look at a uh, challenge mm -hmm. and opportunity yeah each person i've seen um uh, we we have uh, because we also don't separate life from work bhavna so we don't have these artificial things so if somebody's child is going through a class 12 exam and you know is also is allowed to feel overwhelmed because the child is giving exam after exam week after week and she says i'm at my wits end and you know to even have a access of a support system of saying would you like to speak with such and such or you know do you want to have a conversation so it's mm. not it's absolutely okay to have a life that is integrated and that's mm. natural and i think mm. it's it's whole and wholesome as opposed mm -hmm. to say that i will wear my 9 to 6 you'd wonder where this question is answers going but what i'm what i'm trying to say is that it is all part of recognizing that we are a whole person not hands mm -hmm. legs and 
head, you know, that a workplace engages. And I think workplaces, the ones that recognize it, and I'm sure it's becoming more commonplace because that's the Mm -hmm. risk Mm -hmm. to retain and younger people like millennials, Gen Zs, for example, they're very clear about what value are you adding to me? And, you know, Mm -hmm. they are able to see themselves as whole and they're willing to make the trade-offs with respect to how they want to live their life uh, Mm. as well. So Mm. there is each of the caregiving experiences, the whether Mm. it is of a special needs child, I think, Mm. or uh, elder, brings in a couple of things. One, uh, you realize that there are no shortcuts. Mm. You have to go through the grind of Mm. doing something consistently. Uh, Second, it is about planning because you know that Mm. there are some built in uh, requirements and you need to be able to be planful and plan ahead. Thirdly, I think patience. Mm. It builds the ability to wait and hold. And particularly in today's Mm. time where we are getting increasingly impatient because of the buffering and the, yeah. you know, the irritation that comes from that. Uh, it You realize that all good things take time. Mm. Uh, relationships take time, be it at the workplace or in personal life. And I think the importance of being able to wait or without mm. something happening or the entitlement as we as humans want something like at the click of a button or a, mm. a 10 minute delivery needs to be counterbalanced with some things which are still old world and slow. And I think mm-hmm. caregiving is a very big part of that experience yeah. that you just yeah. have to be in the sewing sometimes, uh, mm-hmm. not knowing what the outcomes would be, but you are doing it doggedly because you come mm-hmm. from a place of patient, you know, the other centric or care centric or, uh, yeah elder centric or child centric whatever is your view there to that caregiving because otherwise yeah. you would not again bring your best self to your your caregiver self right you would be right. Res- resentment is a killer um uh, anger which is bottled a sense of uh, you know why me pity all these are negative emotions which i think will adversely impact work in the workplace and therefore the need of that perspective of even helping the caregiver cope because as humans Mm. there will be times when you know or even things like uh, simple things like uh, knowing self-care and and I I spend Mm. a lot of important I give a lot of importance to self-care uh, mm-hmm. All of which are going to help the organization. You know, I think a caregiver mm-hmm. has extra responsibility at self care because you are like that the airline example of the you have to wear the uh, oxygen mask on yourself first, and therefore mm-hmm. self care becomes vital for somebody who is mm-hmm. engaged in elder care. So uh, or caregiving of any kind. Isn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Um, you know. For most people, caregiving is such an invisible and in the background issue. Uh, Oftentimes, it is something that, you know, just somehow is happening around us. And uh, we become cognizant of it only when it is a very big part of our lives. And you spoke about it before. Uh, sometimes in our conversation and also in this conversation, which is that, um, of course, there are, I mean, it's it's the very basis of our interaction, um, you know, the quality of our humanity uh, and who we are, but also that, um, you know, caregiving is a skilled task and it requires planning and it requires, uh, to quote one of your posts, it requires a project management approach. Uh, <laughs> And uh, very often we find that individuals who are active caregivers tend to fall into caregiving by circumstance and not necessarily planning. Uh, And then, you know, you're just coping with it or playing a catch up game. 
So I'd like for you to take both the views of as a caregiver, when you're not yet a caregiver, we will all be caregivers. So how do you plan for it? Yeah. I but as an organization all... as well. Yeah. No, I think uh, it's a very important thing. So I'll take the organization uh, point of view. Mm. I think uh, it makes good business sense to make it easier for your employees to bring their whole selves to work, which means right. uh, having spaces for conversation, holding space for, uh, you know, whether it is the, the, the manager or the, the supervisor. So having a MB HR, when I say HR, I mean, I'm thinking of it as it's, it's almost like a central function, which is holding, you know, the space for the employee, mm -hmm. the whether it is places for rest. And, you know, like I say, Lumiere is like a lab bhavna. So, you know, little mm -hmm. things. So, for example, we have an ideation room. We have mm -hmm. one of the, uh, uh, our help who comes to work, mm -hmm. who has been bringing her daughter from the time she was three to the workplace. And, you know, she stays, mm -hmm. she studies there. So there is a place. Mm -hmm. We also have a, it doubles up as a gym. So we have an exercise cycle and a treadmill and, you know, so, so, not exercise mm -hmm. cycle, a treadmill. And so what I'm saying is you embed self-care care mm. for the others you mm. talk about it we also have events where we invite some of the elders in the community to our invite mm. to our uh, events those whose kids may be overseas so it's again about right. inclusive and you know extending your caregiving from just the uh, family or the the filial relationships or blood relationships to saying how can i be a better a person in my community and be a little thoughtful mm -hmm. about people who might need that where you break access available somebody should feel comfortable to call me and say hey you know, Deepa, my cook isn't coming do you think you can you know like is there somebody i can get something from i just gave example of cook but it could be uh so so, so you're not running to do everything yourself but if you have an enabling ecosystem, uh, Bhavna, which I believe in. So one of the things we've done very consciously is to build an ecosystem of access, doctors, hospitals, with whom we have relationships that we have nurtured over decades. And these people will then know that, you know, for an eye surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, so all of the medical needs, including people who can do geriatric counseling, there is a whole ecosystem, people who are you know, in the in the space of uh, uh, all all kinds of, in fact, uh, supports, uh, and you know, both doctors as well as allied services. Again, uh, elder services. I'm just talking elder as an example, but that planful approach is a must because mm -hmm. uh, it's like it's like saying if we do not. Yes, we'll cross the bridge when it happens. But to think of possibilities, to say what is mm -hmm. going to happen when, uh, let's say, there is going to be this need, okay? And what's the kind of care, carer support we need? What can we outsource? What can mm -hmm. we delegate? What kind of training is required? Who is going to step mm -hmm. in when? And therefore, co-opting mm -hmm. the family also and having those conversations, if one has the access to it and having them these early conversations, Bhavna are important. And I've, today, mm -hmm. I today, I say this at every forum. I said, you know, young like parents are doing so much to financially secure their children or they are doing mm -hmm. so much to with respect to giving them the right education. But the right. biggest responsibility we have to them is by giving them health capital. What do I mean by health capital? If the parents nurture, do the right things for their health in terms of body, mind, spirit, you are going to be well, healthy. And that's the biggest legacy or the yeah. biggest peace of mind that you're giving your child today we, we have yeah. seen young people saddled with the responsibility of elder care early on you know somebody yeah. who needs uh, to be taken for dialysis or you know somebody who's having some kind of a thing to manage uh, they've probably done a lot with infest creating wealth material wealth yeah. for these kids but, mm. but it's still not, you put them in a caregiving slot very early. So I think that's mm. also part of the responsibility that I think mm. people must 
uh, be mindful of and because so we know it. it's so mm. so important again on yeah. the personal front when there were two things that happened one is we had to plan for our we wanted to plan for our in-laws at a put you know to to be able to come and stay with us so we actually got one level of our home ready with their inputs to make it the way they liked without any pressure on them ke when they'll come and stay with us and the time mm-hmm. came after that uh and they were with us end of life for 7 years my mother in law mm-hmm. had parkinson's uh my father in law led a full life and he passed at uh, uh, 90 plus mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. you know we had a ecosystem there and it was not only delegation so there was delegation mm-hmm. but it went mm-hmm. a little bit of supervision a little bit of you know giving them the space making sure that they can entertain giving them all of the elements of a good life you know connections mm-hmm. with family and friends and you know maybe mm-hmm. hosting some parties and get togethers uh meeting them every day for a little bit of time so and all this was mm-hmm. possible because you know my workplace and home are close by so you know we could and it's not always impossible but creativity again is very important bhavna saying what does my senior need yeah and how can i creatively yeah. provide that if not myself So today we've teamed up my speech therapist who is in Nasik with my physiotherapist here, and between them and a tablet they are doing speech therapy for my father twice a week. Now mm. this is a very creative solution, but it came yeah. because how do we make sure that he's been he's eighty going to be eighty nine and he's been mm. taking physiotherapy four days a week, speech therapy mm. twice a week, and we've continued that from the beginning. when people say what about resources my question always is that what the person earned in their life mm. is for them and a royal mm. life so nobody needs to feel we told my father very early on ki you don't have to feel you know burdened or anything this and we you know whether we spent it or otherwise because you know we always let him feel that he was you know it's his he's the agent you know he's he has the agency for this and um, i think it's a very important part of not making the person you're caring for be any feel any lesser or diminished because they are not they the right. core person is the same that illness mm. or a debilitating condition is different and separate from the core so it's very yeah. important in caregiving not to become holier than thou patronizing superior mm. or start mm. you know talking down to your uh, because it's a it could it's a leadership position so it's very yeah. important to keep yourself on equal footing and humble because you never know but for the grace of god you would be in the other situation any time so you will be eventually <laughs> correct so i think it's important to be humble yeah. and care giving keeps you you know it's like tapa you know it's mm. like tapa the heat refines you i think yeah. it melts you you know yeah it does uh you know there are so many questions i would have asked you but you kind of just covered them without my asking you so i just feel so lovely about that uh what i would like um to get back to is you spoke a little bit about what is it that you know the certain competencies that are valuable for organizations that are valuable for leaders or managers or even individuals ourselves and that exposure is um inherent in caregiving and now with increasingly smaller families or distributed families or different definitions of families uh, it may not be easy to access caregiving experiences yeah yeah mm-hmm. um any thoughts or ideas or what is it that we could do as a society so right now beyond organizations and families but as societies to uh you know bring in this very core element of humanity compassion uh which can only be aided through caregiving in my view and how beautifully you said while caring for uh someone who doesn't have a voice of their own right uh whether it is the climate or it is animals or it is uh anybody who's vulnerable absolutely what do you think we can do is an opportunity for you to blue sky 
so actually you know, there is a very interesting organization so as you know i do learning mondays and torch bearer things yes. and i'm always scouting for people who are doing new and interesting things so there is a couple in the united states that has set up a volunteering organization you know very digital mm -hmm. forward tech based tech advanced and the indian couple uh, pratima and uh, her husband ram krishna and they came as my pratima came as my guest and volunteering for elders is a again a community opportunity yeah. where you are let's say a student or you live by yourself and then there is an elderly person somewhere and you can you know sign up for activities that you can do whether it's walking their walk, walking the dog or it could be mowing the lawn or it could, could be buying the grocery or having a conversation uh, you know on so, certain days of the week and it's a, a beautiful uh, idea uh, that i that pratima came and spoke about 2 years ago and i actively look at what she's doing on social media and she publishes uh, stuff so this is a community uh, idea yes. very creative uh yeah. and, and it it's a kind of uh, sharing and i think for yeah. people who get an opportunity to do that uh is great the other place uh, that i think there is in our country uh, bhavna you just look around and there are opportunities of what we do and people are doing things whether it's they're doing things for their the, the home stuff that they have or you know little little things all of which i think falls under the space of caring you know caring for someone's uh, career advancement or the education of your helpers child or you know something because i feel that as a people because we have a I, I i strongly feel from an archetypal point of view indians have a very sit very strongly in the caregiver archetype bhavna i really mm -hmm. feel so, i agree know? yeah and it is something that if we get an opportunity i always think if we get an opportunity to do that it first of all and if we can show our children early on uh, mm -hmm. you are also creating something which is a less self centered and a selfish world uh, mm -hmm. which is what i think we badly need in our times like you talked about the planet so mm -hmm. just saying you know what are separating needs from wants and caregiving yeah. actually puts you in a situation where you say you know what's the worst that can happen and you know what yeah. is the that i need <laughs> and it really helps you reprioritize and reframe which i think mm -hmm. every one of us uh at a at a juncture would need a good solid reminder and caregiving yeah. opportunity is one such opportunity to ground ourselves isn't it yeah totally i i relate with it at so many levels and um you know uh, what a wonderful way for us to kind of bring a conversation which i think we could just go on and on and listen to you uh you know beautifully articulate the different aspects i think uh, definitely guided by your life experience but also your ability to uh your ability to put it in a in a in a beautiful way uh and um help people see things that uh, are all around us but perhaps not necessarily framed the way that you have framed them so um i definitely like to thank you for your time and your insights and perspective and generosity in sharing them uh over to you for any closing remarks for our conversation and what your wish for no i think thank you i've enjoyed this conversation uh, bhavna because uh, you know i just uh two days ago i was at a condolence visit and mm -hmm. uh, you know someone who is well uh, just has a can you know has cancer gets diagnosed and is gone within 3 months and at the mm -hmm. stage at at 60 just when you thought life was going to start for the family again and you know you were going to you put a few things on hold and you're going to start so i feel that one to recognize that uh human life is finite human mm. life is an arc what a baby needs and what an elder needs and our lives are such that you know there will be the, sometimes the baby is unreasonable just like that someone in their 80 plus or 70 plus can become very stubborn and very uh, you know very mm. uh, uh, 
you know, very determined in their ways. And I think the, the whole area of understanding that there are certain needs, the person may have some debility, but the core mm. person remains the same. Uh, mm. it, it is very, very important for caregivers to not be patronizing and to make the caregiving experience joyous rather than painful mm. as a choice. How do you bring joy? How do you infuse humor? How do you bring inclusiveness? How do you bring, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a sense of interdependence as opposed mm. to dependence, you know, as a family? Absolutely. Well, because we are gaining as much as caregivers as we totally. are giving. And therefore, it's very important to bring that at the center to make yeah. this the way it's meant to be. It's meant to be yeah. joyous. It's meant to refine us, but it's not meant to flog us and flagellate us. It's meant to elevate yeah. us. And if we can get out of the way of our little egos and enjoy the expansion in heart and mind that it comes through the caregiving experience. Uh, and also it's very humbling for the receiver of care. Remember, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not it's easy. Not easy. So it's very important from time to time to do a little role switch in the head and then to come from a place of, you know, just bring the pendulum stable in the center uh, to go on. So I think that's yeah. what I would say. And workplaces would be better the moment we accepted the fact that caregiving is uh, not a by the way thing on the side. Yeah. Right? It is yeah. integral. It is like the food yeah. we eat the clothes we wear, the rest we need, and caring is being equals being human to me. Yeah. Yeah. Caring equals being human beyond, uh, and it is not just something that women do uh, magically because they are multitaskers and the stereotypes around that, uh, or that, you know, biologically you produce a child and therefore you have to, and you have to X chromosomes makes you a better uh, caregiver. <laughs> uh, <laughs> are such uh, myths that one encounters again and again. But thank you for busting them in your loving, gentle way. I have so much enjoyed this conversation and I can't wait for many more people to listen to this. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to many more such conversations with you. Thank you, Bhavna. More power to you and happy to you know, support you in any which way in your journey. Thank you. Thank you.